All right, so welcome everyone. I'm Albert Eisen Jr., Senior Program Manager of Training and Technical Assistance at the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, or APSHA for short, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. I'm delighted that you could join us for this timely and relevant webinar on hepatitis B and the opioid epidemic, opportunities to increase adult vaccination. It's a timely topic considering the recent outbreaks of viral hepatitis that have been linked to the opioid crisis through injecting drug use. Before I move into formal introductions and housekeeping, I want to note that Sunday, July 28th, was World Hepatitis Day. And this group photo on your screen was from last week's annual Hep B United Summit in Washington, DC. Our national partners at the Hepatitis B Foundation convened diverse stakeholder groups at the US Capitol, including our actual policy team. So APSHA is to today's webinar to continue raising awareness on the burden of viral hepatitis, especially in the context of the opioid epidemic that is ravaging individuals, families, and communities across the United States. I'm joined today by my esteemed colleague, Dr. Rita Kuwahara, who is APSHA's Hepatitis B Policy Fellow. In her role, Dr. Kuwahara engages in federal policy to highlight the need to increase adult Hep B vaccination, particularly within the setting of the opioid epidemic as well as raise awareness of the need to increase Hep B testing, vaccination, and linkage to care. Dr. Kuroha is a primary care and internal medicine resident physician and a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Medicine. We're also joined by two other distinguished guest speakers. Dr. Camilla Graham is the co-director of the Viral Hepatitis Center in the Division of Infectious Disease at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and is also an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School in Boston. She is also medical director at Program RISE, which includes a needle exchange program, as well as other services for people at risk for viral hepatitis, HIV, and other complications. She has implemented medical decision support processes to improve the screening vaccination of persons for hepatitis B. And her expertise includes systems improvements to implement medical guidelines, workforce capacity building, and pricing and access to therapeutics. Next, we have Dr. Grace Wong, who is a board certified family physician at International Community Health Services, a federally qualified health center in Seattle, Washington. Dr. Wong graduated from the University of Michigan with a degree in early childhood education. She received her medical training at Cornell University Medical Center, now while Cornell Medicine in New York City, and has a master's degree in public health, also from the University of Michigan. Dr. Wong has worked extensively in primary care and public health in New York City and Seattle. Lastly, I just want to acknowledge my behind the scenes support and planning team at that show, uh, Joe Lee, the TTA director, Christine Alarcon, communications and engagement specialist, and Jennifer Kayanan, technical assistance and media intern. To quickly provide an, a background on that show, we are a national association of 33 community health organizations dedicated to promoting advocacy, collaboration and leadership to increase access to care and improve the health of status of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. We were established in 1987 to form a national voice for the unique needs of the ANHPI serving health centers. APSHO is also a Bureau of Primary Healthcare Training and Technical Assistance National Cooperative Agreement holder that is funded to provide TTA that is data-driven and focused on quality and operational improvement that supports health centers nationwide. Now, we just want to yeah, acknowledge that HRSA has tasked us with being a national TTA provider in three focus areas, including here, increasing access to care, improving health outcomes, and promoting health equity. And we do that through the lens of national audience activities, such as this webinar that you're on today. And secondly, through learning collaboratives, which are much more intimate and includes health centers, PCAs, or primary care associations, as well as the health center control networks. So, Granted, HRSA is um, having us all collaborate and we're always in the pleasure of having different perspectives in the room. So with that said, just want to acknowledge HRSA for its continued investments in app show and house and programs. And lastly, I want to congratulate to any of those HECNs who were recently funded. Um, we hope to work with you all on building the HIT capacity at your health centers nationwide. Now to kick off the, the presentation portion, I just want to say that we have three key objectives that we want you to take away today. The first is to highlight the need to address Hep B within the opioid epidemic, including a national adult Hep B vaccination campaign. Second, to promote opportunities that increase adult Hep B vaccination rates within a community health center setting. 
And thirdly, to increase awareness amongst patients providers about the adult HEPI vaccine. And today's session is made possible by Zoom webinar, which AppShow is using officially and publicly for the first time today. So please bear with us as we introduce this new webinar platform to you. As an attendee in Zoom webinars, you can mute or unmute your audio, virtually raise your hand and send messages via the chat box. First is the audio. To adjust your audio settings in the webinar, click on audio settings on the bottom left-hand corner, and this will open up the audio settings section of your Zoom application setting. You can click the drop downs to change the audio device or adjust the sliders to adjust the volume. Or you can also click on that little um, triangle next to audio settings to change your speaker settings. As for unmute and unmute, we have given you permission to, um, at the end, um, unmute yourselves, but we'll try to minimize the background noise um, and encourage you to use the Q&A and chat feature to minimize feedback. And we will not be using the hand raise feature today, so you can ignore that piece. And then the third option is Q&A. The Q&A window allows you to ask questions to the host and panelists, and we'll be able to reply back to you via the text and the Q&A window or, or answer your questions live at the end. So again, to click Q&A, that will open up the Q&A window. You can type in your questions and click send. Um, and you can also note that sending anonymously, sending anonymously will um, not attach your name to your question during the Q&A live session. All right, and if you are in full, full screen mode, you'll be able to see the PowerPoint, but if you need to switch back to the original size, that'll decrease your Zoom control panel and window. Um, and then the last feature I wanna describe is the chat, and you'll be able to host, um, uh, chat to the host, panelists, and other attendees in the meeting room. So just click the chat pod at the bottom of your control panel and direct it to the appropriate audience. And lastly, towards the end, when you want to leave the meeting, you just click meeting um, at the bottom right-hand corner and that'll end the webinar and prompt you to do the evaluation at the very end. So without further ado, I want to kick off our session with the first learning objective to highlight the need to address hepatitis B within the opioid epidemic, um, including a national adult hep B vaccination campaign with Dr. Rita Kurohara. Rita, you can take it away. Thanks, Albert. Um, so I'm Rita Kavahara, a primary care internal medicine resident physician and hepatitis B policy fellow with the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations. And we would like to thank you for joining today's webinar on hepatitis B and the opioid epidemic, opportunities to increase adult hepatitis B vaccination. Today, we are delighted to have two distinguished speakers who will be highlighting the need for increased adult hepatitis B vaccination and the maintenance of childhood hepatitis B vaccination in the setting of the opioid epidemic. Before turning it over to Dr. Scram and Wong, I wanted to begin by providing a brief overview of hepatitis B. Next slide, please. Hepatitis B is a viral infection of the liver that is spread via blood and other body fluids, including transmission via injection drug use and mother to child transmission. Up to 2.2 million people in the US have chronic hepatitis B, but only one third are aware of their diagnosis, which means that two thirds are unaware of their infection. In addition, only 25% of adults are vaccinated against hepatitis B. Hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV are spread through similar means of transmission. So individuals at increased risk for HIV and hepatitis C are also at risk for being infected by hepatitis B. Hepatitis B and hepatitis C can both result in chronic viral hepatitis. Hepatitis B has a safe and highly effective vaccine to prevent infection, but has no cure. The hepatitis B vaccine was the first anti-cancer vaccine to be developed and is projected to have prevented 310 million cases of hepatitis B worldwide from 1990 through 2020. For those who are not vaccinated against hepatitis B and acquired chronic hepatitis B infection, the cost of managing chronic hepatitis B infection is high, with individuals with chronic hepatitis B requiring lifelong access to medical care, including frequent medical appointments, regular diagnostic imaging and labs, and high cost medications, which can be prohibitively expensive. Further, the health consequences of unmanaged chronic hepatitis B are significant, with one in four individuals with unmanaged chronic hepatitis B developing liver cancer, liver failure, and or cirrhosis, or scarring of the liver, and liver cancer, 
only has an 18% five-year survival rate. In contrast to hepatitis B, hepatitis C has no vaccine but has a cure. On the other hand, hepatitis A, which does have a vaccine, is spread via the fecal oral route and only causes acute infection. Next slide, please. For hepatitis B, we have recently seen alarming rises in acute hepatitis B infection, which is being fueled by the opioid epidemic and low adult hepatitis B vaccination rates. Nationwide, acute hepatitis B increased 20% in 2015. However, states most affected by the opioid epidemic saw alarming rises in acute hepatitis B, including a 729% increase in acute hepatitis B in Maine from 2015 to 2017, a 114% increase in Kentucky, Tennessee, and West Virginia from 2009 to 2013, a 78% increase in southeastern Massachusetts in 2017, and a 62% increase in North Carolina from 2012 to 2016. Also of note, in Maine, 55% of individuals newly infected with hepatitis B required hospitalization, 15% were baby boomers, and the average age of those acutely infected was 42, which was higher than the average age of 33 for new hepatitis C infections in the state. Next slide, please. Universal childhood hepatitis B vaccination was implemented in the United States in the mid 1990s. So the majority of individuals under the age of 25 years who were born in the US were likely vaccinated as children. However, only 25% of adults over 19 are currently vaccinated against hepatitis B. For subpopulations of adults, hepatitis B vaccination rates are even lower. For example, only 12% of adults with diabetes over the age of 60 are vaccinated against hepatitis B. This low vaccination rate among adults is largely due to a lack of awareness of the vaccine in the community, as well as among providers. The, Uni the United States Preventive Services Task Force recommends hepatitis B vaccination for adults with a wide range of conditions and exposures, including individuals with diabetes, chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease on dialysis, HIV, hepatitis C, persons who inject drugs, many individuals born outside of the United States, men who have sex with men, incarcerated individuals, healthcare workers, and most importantly, anyone who asks to be vaccinated. In addition, all pregnant women are currently screened for hepatitis B, and, is an, and it is important to not miss opportunities to vaccinate pregnant women who are susceptible to acquiring hepatitis B infection. Because adult hepatitis B vaccination is recommended by the USPSTF, patients can receive hepatitis B testing and vaccination with no cost sharing if they have private insurance, Medicare, and most of Medicaid. However, because many providers and individuals at risk for hepatitis B are not aware that they can receive the hepatitis B vaccine with no patient cost sharing, adult hepatitis B vaccination rates remain low. In the setting of the opioid epidemic, there are multiple opportunities to prevent hepatitis B infections by increasing adult testing and vaccination. In addition, in the past year, a new hepatitis B vaccine was approved for adults. So now instead of individuals requiring three doses over a six month period, individuals can be fully protected with just two doses of the vaccine administered over a one month period. In public health, vaccination is usually the answer when working to end disease outbreaks and eliminate deadly diseases. Because we have vaccines to prevent hepatitis B, there should not be a single new hepatitis B infection if we work to increase adult vaccination. Next slide, please. Members of the United States House of Representatives and the US Senate have recently identified the need to increase adult hepatitis B vaccination within the setting of the opioid epidemic and have taken congressional action to highlight this need. On April 30th, 2019, Congressman Hank Johnson and Congresswoman Grace Meng, the co-chairs of the Congressional Hepatitis Caucus, introduced House Resolution 331 in the US House of Representatives to designate April 30th as National Adult Hepatitis B Vaccination Awareness Day. In coordination with this, Senators Maisie Hirono and Angus King introduced Senate Resolution 177 in the U.S. Senate. We are delighted that the U.S. Congress is interested in increasing adult hepatitis B vaccination within the setting of the opioid epidemic and are highly encouraged by the fact that over 75 major medical, public health, and community-based organizations endorse this resolution, including the American Medical Association and the American Public Health Association. Within the opioid epidemic, as community support services, 
formed to assist those with opioid addiction, it is vital to provide comprehensive services to these individuals, including HIV, hepatitis B and C testing, and hepatitis A and B vaccination. Whenever programs are discussing the need to provide hepatitis C testing and hepatitis A vaccination within the opioid epidemic, it is vital to also talk about and provide hepatitis B testing and vaccination. In order to meet hepatitis B elimination goals, it is vital to increase adult hepatitis B vaccination and maintain high levels of childhood hepatitis B vaccination. Further, while it is wonderful that there is a renewed focus in our nation to eliminate HIV, I would challenge us to simultaneously work to eliminate hepatitis B and C as everyone at risk for HIV is at risk for hepatitis B and C and we have a vaccine to prevent hepatitis B and a cure for hepatitis C. In addition, as work is being done to increase hepatitis A vaccination within the opioid epidemic, it is important to also increase adult hepatitis B vaccination and testing, as those at risk of acquiring hepatitis A are also at risk of developing hepatitis B infection if they are not protected through vaccination. In order to prevent further outbreaks of hepatitis B in the setting of the opioid epidemic, we must increase adult hepatitis B vaccination rates by increasing provider and community awareness of the hepatitis B vaccine and make it easier for individuals to receive hepatitis B testing and vaccination in a variety of settings, including in non-clinical settings, such as harm reduction and syringe service programs, and by implementing policies that help to increase adult hepatitis B vaccination rates in primary care settings, such as through the introduction of standing orders for vaccination, as well as by ensuring procedures are in place to remind patients when to come in to, com to complete their vaccination series and by stocking the vaccine in clinics that care for adults. I would now like to turn it over to our distinguished speakers to further discuss opportunities to prevent the spread of hepatitis B within the opioid epidemic by implementing strategies to increase adult hepatitis B vaccination. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kurohara. So now we're gonna segue into the next presentation by Dr. Graham on hepatitis B in persons who inject drugs. So Dr. Graham, take it away. Okay, thanks a lot. I wanna thank the organizers for letting me talk about a couple of programs, though uh, not designed exclusively for people who inject drugs, uh, do incorporate the specific needs of people whose lives have been touched by the opioid crisis. Uh, next slide, please. I have no disclosures. So I'm going to talk about very distinct initiatives in two different care settings that I'm involved with. And just to, so it's clear what I'm talking about, the first one I'm going to talk about is Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center um, and its affiliated medical practices. Um, there are tertiary care centers, uh, hospitals, there are uh, 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 private practices, there are community health centers. This is a very big, complex medical system. A number of these affiliates have the same electronic medical record, and I'm going to be talking about initiatives that all of the affiliates that use the same medical record system uh, are, are, are influenced by. The second thing I'm going to talk about is Program RISE, which is a JRI, Justice Resource Institute, health affiliate. This is a community-based organization. It is not a health center. So some of the things I want to talk about is how to bring health initiatives into a non-health care center uh, 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 venue because there are times you can't expect people to come to see you. Um, this is located in Framingham, Massachusetts. I'll tell you later why it's important. Um, and there are programs that serve people living with HIV, people inject drugs, international populations, a large refugee population, TLBT youth of color, um, and, and other uh, underserved groups. It does provide testing for STIs, HIV, hepatitis B and C. They, we are able to give vaccines, do uh, labs, and provide treatment for STIs and PrEP. Um, and perform needle exchange and Narcan training. Um, and we coordinate with Quest Labs and Specialty Pharmacy um, for, to help us with these expanded services. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why that's, that's helped make this possible. Next slide. Okay, so you just heard from um, uh, Dr. Kuwahara uh, the groups of people that are supposed to be vaccinated for hepatitis B. Now, if, if any of you have tried to do risk-based 
testing of anything, you know that it often doesn't work well, especially when you're talking about sensitive behaviors like, say, uh, drug use. And um, so, first of all, I think we have to really sort of think about how we're going to implement programs when a lot of these issues are sensitive. Um, so I'm not going to go through this whole list, but I'm going to point out a handful of, of risk factors, STIs, injection drug use, diabetes, and chronic liver disease. And I'm going to show you on the next slide why I'm doing that. Next slide. So I wanted to know um, at BI, uh, how well we were doing around the hepatitis B cascade of care. And I picked out several groups of patients who theoretically should have been tested for hepatitis B. If they hadn't been um, exposed, they, they, they received vaccination, and just get a sense of how many we had already identified, understanding that at least 60% of people with hepatitis B have not been identified. And you, I'm not going to go through these numbers, but you can see um, we are not doing a good job. When I look back at the graph that um, you saw previously around the rates of, of, um, of vaccination in different risk groups, um, we're probably about within the range for at least some of these um, groups. And, um, and I suspect if, 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 if uh, this, this is probably relatively common. Now, I will say I couldn't actually know that I was capturing all the vaccinations and everything, but this is a little bit of a, of a snapshot that even when you're just looking at the people who've been tested, which is the first stage of your cascade, if you haven't been tested, you're probably not getting Next slide. So um, one thing that we recognized was that we had these silos um, so we had a group of people who wanted to find people who are chronically infected with hepatitis B. We had one group that wanted to find, you know, pregnant women so they could decrease perinatal transmission. We had another group that was sort of more publicly health-minded that was looking at public health opportunities to vaccinate um, at-risk people. Um, but the fact is, you know, all of us are one of those people. Um, and so you can really argue all of us need to be um, testing uh, for hepatitis B. And, um, and this is because it's hard to really figure out exactly who needs to be tested to identify people with chronic infection who need further management, obviously. Um, the, the group of people who need to be vaccinated who, after testing, have never been exposed um, is a very large group. It's probably 75% uh, of adults in the United States if you really um, calculated all the categories. And then, of course, you've got people who've been exposed and are at risk for reactivation with immune suppression or other conditions. And so the best combination is surface antibody, surface antigen, and core antibody. Um, and one thing we found in the table that I showed you earlier was we actually had a sort of a higgly piggly mess of testing that was being ordered. It was not consistent. That was the first thing that we had to um, fix. And then just pulling back to the topic today, um, every person who's been identified who um, injects drugs needs that full testing panel for hepatitis B um, because you want to identify people who need to be vaccinated, people who are already infected, who need management. And it also impacts hepatitis C treatment, which is common in people uh, who inject drugs, and uh, it has implications for pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV treatment. Next slide. Uh, so what we did, the first thing I wanted to show you all, is um, instead of trying to teach everyone to remember the tests that need to be done, we actually just created something called the Hepatitis B Screening Panel. Um, and it includes all three tests that you need to appropriately characterize people. This immediately reduced the ordering errors uh, that we were seeing. And I will say um, a group of us has been working with Quest um, to modify their order set so you end up with sort of this equivalent hepatitis B screening panel um, so, so people know that they're ordering the right test. Next slide. Now, when you get those three tests, you can categorize people. And I want to point out a couple of things that are specifically important for people who inject drugs. So one of them is um, I think we're becoming more aware that people who inject drugs are at risk for HIV. As you may know, we've had a, a large outbreak of, of HIV, acute HIV um, in the uh, uh, opioid using community um, here in Massachusetts. And so this became a really urgent public health um, issue. But if you're gonna start somebody on PrEP, you have to know their hepatitis B status. Because if you're 
inadvertently treating chronic hepatitis B infection in the setting of PrEP, you can cause a lot of harm. You want to monitor that hepatitis B. It doesn't mean you can't get PrEP. Absolutely, they need PrEP, but they, it, it's a different management algorithm. Um, and if you're putting them on PrEP, you certainly don't want them getting newly infected with hepatitis B if they're intermittent in their use of their PrEP. So all of those people who haven't been exposed need to be uh, vaccinated. Um, another implication, as I said, is if uh, someone is being treated for hepatitis C and they have been exposed to hepatitis B, they are at risk for reactivation. And you're going to want to do a testing algorithm to figure out those people because some of them actually need treatment for the hepatitis B while they undergo treatment for the hepatitis C so they don't end up with liver flares that actually in a few cases have been fatal. Next slide. So um, you already heard a little bit about the two-dose vaccine um, that we um, are now uh, uh, have access to, uh, many of us. And um, the reason this really actually changes a number of the sort of work uh, flows uh, for people who inject drugs is uh, we have felt that this is um, obviously a very high-risk population community. And um, so this is one group that once we finish vac the vaccination series, you want to test for surface antibody to make sure that they actually seroconverted, that they actually have immune protection because the risk if they are someone who doesn't respond is high. And so you can see with the older three-dose vaccine and Jurex B here for an example, um, even in a young um, otherwise healthy population, only 94% of people actually developed effective immune protection, while with the two-dose newer vaccine, it's 100%. So now if we know we can give people hepatitis B, we don't do follow-up serological testing to ensure um, immunity. This is going to be a different practice pattern in different places, but just giving you an example of what we do. Next slide. Okay, so um, at Beth is Dual Deaconess, we have made hepatitis A B the default hepatitis B vaccine for most groups, but it is important to recognize it's not approved for certain populations. And from a programming standpoint, you need to make sure that people understand the differences between the different formulations, doses, and dosing schedules. Um, this actually slowed our implementation of this program down, I would say, by about six months. And I've talked to a bunch of other people who said that their programming people um, have had trouble with this as well. So I specifically put this screenshot of what our order set looks like so you can take it to your programming people for your electronic micro records and say, here's an example of how one institution did this. There might be lots of other ways to do this, um, but here's what you get. So if you've got a practice that has a lot of pediatrics, pediatric patients have not been approved for hepatitis A, B, you need to also have, you know, that option for the pediatric dose of one of the older vaccines, for example. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I'm switching gear here. Um, another program that I work with is, is Program RISE. And um, this stemmed from a realization, I sit on um, an advisory group for the Department of Public Health around viral hepatitis, um, that we were having outbreaks of hepatitis B in the south of Massachusetts. We we're having outbreaks of, of uh, obviously, HIV, I discussed. Uh, a lot of people had hepatitis C. We we're seeing a lot of acute cases of hepatitis C, especially in our uh, youth, especially in um, people uh, whose lives were touched by the opioid crisis. And, um, and we're actually seeing a lot of hepatitis A. And um, we have a needle exchange program in Boston. We have a needle exchange program in Worcester. Um, but those are two cities that are fairly far away, especially people who have transportation challenges. And Framingham um, happens to be right in the middle of those two cities. And it's the city I live in. Um, and so um, I was able to kind of work with our local public health department and city officials. If you are in a community that does not have needle exchange, um, one thing you may need to do in order to be able to provide the care your community needs is advocate around the importance of needle exchange as part of a comprehensive care program for people uh, who inject drugs. 
um, to your city councilors, to your mayor, to your fire and, and, and police chief, and whoever else might be a stakeholder in that discussion. So that's what we did, and we got this approved. And so we now screen all clients uh, for hepatitis B with those three tests. Um, if we can, if they have health insurance, we use health insurance. As you know, we're a fairly high insurance rate um, uh, state, uh, but uh, the, the folks that are undocumented uh, don't have health insurance. And so we have grants to cover um, everybody who doesn't have insurance that we are able to tap into. Um, and we basically screen everybody unless they have actual documentation of prior uh, surface antibodies. If they say they've been vaccinated, we don't know if they're one of those people who didn't respond to the older vaccine. Everybody gets tested. Um, and if all tests are negative, they get vaccinated. Again, we try to use insurance if people have it. I will say I asked our Massachusetts Department of Public Health for hepatitis A B because this is a population where we can get, you know, you vaccinate them day one, you can get them back in a month because maybe they need STI testing or repeat HIV testing or counseling or something else. Six months later is hard um, for, for a lot of populations. And so, um, you know, trying to figure out how to get that six month vaccine, that's what we're trying to um, uh, 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 use hepatitis A, B. And I'm, if anybody knows, uh, you know, they can put in a good word. I'm a little bit irritated with DPH right now uh, we, because we do want hepatitis A, B. We do provide PrEP for people who are surface antibody positive or chronic infection, um, but keep in mind they need hepatitis B monitoring. Um, and at the moment we are referring people who have chronic hepatitis B uh, to other facilities for their hepatitis B care. Our goal is to eventually provide that care at program rise if this is the client's preference. What we've realized is people feel safe and comfortable at this program. And so instead of making them come to Beth Israel Deaconess, which they won't do, or making them go someplace else, what can you bring to the person where they feel safe to deliver the care that they need to keep them as healthy as possible? And it's a, it's a frame shift in terms of how we think about care. Um, and I think this is really where we need to go uh, for many populations, especially people inject drugs, because there's a lot of places where they don't feel safe. They feel judged and stigmatized. And we are uh, filing as a 340B entity uh, to try to make that um, happen. And is that my last slide, folks? Yep, that's your last slide, Dr. Graham. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much for your perspective in Massachusetts and the work you're doing in that state. And we're gonna to travel to the West Coast now and hear from Dr. Wong in Seattle on how they have used Pop IT and the community health center setting um, for hep B screening and vaccination. So Dr. Wong, you can take it away. Thanks. Uh, so uh, greetings from Seattle and thanks for the opportunity to share our health center's experience with efforts to improve hepatitis B care. Next slide, please. So um, what I'm going to be telling you about is uh, NIH funded research project called um, HITB. And it was an uh, effort to look at the ability of health information technology to improve hepatitis B care at a federally qualified health center, which is um, the health center where I work, International Community Health Services, um, and specifically looking at the areas of screening, vaccination, and linkage to care. Um, our health center partnered with APCHO, your host for this webinar, and the primary investigators um, you see listed here, I want to give a special shout out to Dr. Cha Wong, who is um, our colleague at the health center. She's an infectious disease specialist, and she's um, been seeing patients at our health center um, now twice a month for um, over a decade. Next slide. So here you see the project rationale, um, which includes health information technology potential for both individual and system level improvements. And as you've seen in earlier slides, high rates of hepatitis B in the Asian and Pacific Island community and the fact that two thirds of those with chronic hepatitis B infection 
are unaware that they carry the virus. Next slide, please. Here's some information about the study setting, our health center. As I said before, we are a federally qualified health center. We are located in King County, Washington. The study involved three sites, two of which are located in the city of Seattle. And at the time of the study, a somewhat newer site um, located in Bellevue, which for those of you who are familiar with our local geography is located across Lake Washington from Seattle. The health center now has four primary care sites. Um, we have a couple of school-based health centers, a mobile dental clinic, and a primary care practice embedded in a community mental health organization, Agent Counseling and Referral Services, or ACRS. Uh, for the last complete calendar year, 2018, close to 32,000 patients received care at the health center. And I've put a couple of um, demographics um, that are quite relevant to this study. 70% um, are Asian American Pacific Island and over half um, do not speak English. I've listed some of the most common languages spoken by our patients. And again, in the later slide, you'll see why this information is important. Um, and if you can't read the small print, uh, the most common languages are Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Spanish, and um, East African languages spoken in the Horn of Africa, uh, Tigrinya, Somali, and Amharic. Um, I should also add that um, the study population consisted of non-pregnant adults ages 18 to 70. Next slide, please. So in the early part of the project, there were needs assessment activities, which identified barriers that you see listed here. Um, the need for better and standard hepatitis B care pathways, gaps in care for patients with chronic hepatitis B, um, care team capacity and time constraints and this phenomenon called EHR alert fatigue. Um, for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to be up close and personal um, with an electronic health record from a user perspective, um, EHR alerts are these pop-ups or other methods that the uh, vendors have designed um, to bring something to the attention of the user. And so um, you can well imagine that an overabundance of these alerts may in some cases, unfortunately, have a common final pathway that those of us who remember the Aesop's fable from our childhood um, about the boy who cried wolf. Um, and unfortunately, their purpose doesn't get served. Um, participants in the needs assessment activities also provided uh, recommendations in three areas. Uh, one is uh, something that is really at the core of what we do in health centers, mainly a team-based approach in this instance to address hepatitis B disparities, um, to incorporate hepatitis B care management strategies into existing structures and workflows, and finally, to improve systems for hepatitis B care management and follow-up. Next slide. So obviously, um, if you're doing a research project to study the impact of an intervention, you need a denominator. And this um, rather busy slide shows the methodology used in this particular study to define risk. Um, so um, as you see, it um, made use of um, racial and ethnicity data as well as language. And I recognize that for the subject of this webinar, it may not be the most relevant definition, um, but I also want to point out that for the study, this definition of risk was based on the health center's history of providing services to a historically large Asian and Pacific Island population. 
Um, I also want to say that the methodology and interventions that I'll be showing you in later slides are generalizable to other definitions of risk. So in the case of the topic that we're concerned about in this webinar, um, opioid or injection drug use, um, one might consider using things like ICD-10 codes from a chronic problem list or other uh, sources of diagnosis data. And certainly, um, I don't want to minimize the challenges that have been raised um, in, with earlier speakers about the importance of sensitivity to confidentiality issues. And in many cases, the challenge of actually getting um, this type of information. Um, and um, getting back to the information on the slide, you'll recall that the majority of patients in the study population at our health center um, have indicated that English is not their preferred language. And so on the bottom right, you see how this information um, is used in this algorithm to define risk based on whether or not the language spoken by the patient is from um, what would be considered a high risk hepatitis um, uh, I'm sorry, a high hepatitis B risk area. Next slide, please. So these um, are the study interventions. Um, the first one, the huddle sheet, is a paper-based tool, um, and it's used by providers like me um, with other members of the care team, most often the medical assistant, when we are preparing for individual patient visits. The next is the provider dashboard. And this um, was a report which I, as a provider, um, received about um, performance in a selected suite of measures for my patient panel. And all providers received uh, these reports on a regular basis. And in later slides, I'll be showing you some examples of these two interventions. The third one was an attempt to um, have point of care information or hepatitis B care protocols um, in the electronic health record for decision support. And the fourth um, were, were population health management reports that were used by a care team member to identify and connect with patients with gaps in hepatitis B care. Next slide. So this is an example of what the huddle sheet looks like. This is a tool that we continue to use and was actually in use for several years prior to the study. And the section that's outlined in red was what was added to help with hepatitis B management. And as I mentioned before, this tool is used during the huddle that I have with the medical assistant before we see our patients scheduled for the day. And it helps us to plan um, for these visits. You can see that the document also has information on status for selected common preventive health procedures for adults based on age and sex, such as PAPs, mammograms, or colorectal cancer screening. And there's also information on things that are important to the care of patients with other chronic common conditions, such as diabetes. And you see here information on things such as most recent A1C, lipids, eye exam, or foot exam. Next slide. So this slide and the next one that I'll be showing you are the provider dashboard reports that I used to receive on a regular basis with performance feedback on a variety of measures, including hepatitis B screening. This is a page from the dashboard report, which shows how um, I, as a provider, and my team are doing with measures in a variety of areas, such as PAPS. Um, and in this case, you'll see one that was relevant at the time for meaningful use or after visit summaries. And you'll see the report also gives information on progress 
with respect to the benchmarker goal and if results are moving toward or away from the target for specific measures and um, in some cases um, the measures although not the ones shown on this slide could um, be used to um, calculate the incentives that providers receive next slide uh, this is another page from the dashboard report and here the information is presented in a graphic form with performance over time and you'll see the information about hepatitis B screening in the lower right of the page. Next slide. So the next two slides show the results of the study interventions. On this slide, you see what happened with hepatitis B screening as measured by volume for what we know from Dr. Graham's previous slides, um, one of the three tests that should be used when screening for hepatitis B, or um, in this case, the hepatitis B surface antigen. And you'll see the performance on the left before implementation of the measures and then on the right after the measures and the implementation of the imp implementation i'm sorry the implementation of the interventions is indicated by the gray bar in the middle of the graph and good news um, screening increased as you can see, as indicated by the volume of hepatitis B surface antigen tests. Now, I'm sure the data student among you might be saying, well, is the increase in the number of tests because there were just more patients? And I would say that if you have a chance to read the study and we have the reference at the end of this slide set, um, the answer to that question is that during the baseline period, 21.7% of previously unscreened patients um, were screened, but during the intervention period, a greater percentage or 30% of previously unscreened patients were screened. Next slide. This slide shows what happened with hepatitis B immunization for non-immune patients as measured by the first dose of what was then a three-dose vaccine, but now we know there's a two-dose hepatitis B vaccine available. And as you can see, the immunizations increased after implementation of the study interventions, again, indicated by the gray bar in the middle of the graph. Again, if you have an opportunity to read the study, you'll see that prior to the implementation of the interventions, 11.9% of eligible patients received at least one dose of the hepatitis vaccine, but this increased to 27.9% during the intervention period. So this is my last slide, and I want to thank everyone for their attention and say it's been a pleasure to show you how the HITB study interventions at our health center increase testing and immunizations for hepatitis B and I look forward to the questions. Thank you so much Dr. Wong and I love the visualizations in your EHR and dashboards that really help make those decisions easier um, and we do have plenty of questions coming through the chat box and Q&A pod so just want to remind folks in the audience that you can use the Q&A pod in your control panel to direct your questions to any of the speakers. And so I wanted to kick it off with one question. I believe this would be great for Dr. Kuahara. Um, are there movements to enable the Hep A, Hep B vaccination in pharmacies like the Puvax um, that is administered? Um. Thank you for the question. So I think that um, there are a few challenges uh, with providing the, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's really important to be providing the hepatitis A vaccine at the same time as the hepatitis B vaccine. I know that there are a lot of efforts um, that state health departments and um, other groups are doing to increase Hep A vaccination. And so I think that it's really important to try and integrate Hepatitis B vaccination into that. You're asking specifically about um, the vaccination in the pharmacy setting, which um, is 
great to have a vaccine available in uh, multiple types of settings. I think it's important um, to try and increase because hepatitis B vaccine is covered as a medical benefit. Um, pharmacies that have an affiliated clinic um, can provide the hepatitis B vaccine with no cost sharing for patients with Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance under the Affordable Care Act. Um, but without that, uh, patients can sometimes run into some difficulties. So I think it's really important to um, ensure that we are getting as many patients as possible um, vaccinated by um, of referring them to the places that they can get the vaccine or providing the vaccine in uh, clinical settings. But I think that um, it's really important to have an integrated approach. Thank you. And we have another question and this one might be directed towards Dr. Graham or Dr. Kohara, but my uh, person says, my client received the first two vaccines. Now he was told that he needs to start another thread because the third one that is due in December will not be available anymore. Um, and I think the follow-up to that, let me just make sure. Um, why is Endurex B being discontinued in public hospitals and clinics? Uh, I'll start with that. Uh, the uh, I, I know in our hospital, uh, we would sometimes have uh, supply chain problems with Endurex B and then we would switch, switch to Recombivax and then there would be a problem with Recombivax and we'd switch back to Endurex B. And it, it became very confusing because we actually just had an order. It was like hepatitis B vaccine. Um, but, you know, they're different for different patient populations. Like the, the folk, people who uh, have to have hemodialysis get a different dose and everything. So, so there's already a lot of confusion. But there are populations that, that have to be able to access either Indrix B or Recombivax because there are not data um, for hepatitis B at this point. Um, and, I, and that's why I, I showed you that list. Um, so there, I, I, I'm not aware of anyone that's exclusively using hepatitis A, B, and until there are data showing that there's, you know, that it's safe and effective in all of those other groups of patients, um, no one can use only hepatitis A, B. So I'm not quite sure what, what, what the actual issue is, and I'm wondering if there's just a supply chain problem and not they actively took away all of the older vaccine because that, that wouldn't make sense to me. Thanks, Dr. Graham. And there's another question for you as well. Um, someone wants to know more about the Framingham population and demographic profiles. They're very intrigued. Yeah. Uh, presentation on the community program aspect and wants to know um, generally are there any sense of stigma or barriers to care among people of color in the community-based program for people who inject drugs? Yes, yeah, so uh, Framingham um, is an interesting community. 25% of people living in Framingham were born outside of the United States. Our high school um, has 70 languages represented um, in it. So it's a very, very international community. Um, and um, so we have, um, you know, we, we, we just, we have, a, we have a, a, a wide variety of people from all sorts of different backgrounds um, who come to Program RISE because they either um, have HIV and, and need to tap into the, the uh, HIV uh, management services, um, or they are um, in the community and this is the easiest place to get screening, regular screening for sexually transmitted diseases or get started on um, PrEP or um, they uh, are undocumented and are coming from one of the outreach programs that does screening in these um, specific communities but then doesn't have access to treatment so they um, bring people to Program RISE to actually get the treatment. Um, we're the only community-based um, group I'm aware of in Massachusetts uh, that also actually does the treatment. And um, I, I think this is the trend. This is where we, we, we should be going. Um, and I think if you have a specific community organization that, that, that uniquely meets the needs of that particular community, um, then 
you, this is where they're coming. They're already coming there for other reasons. And that's a great place to then integrate all of these other care services. I'm not sure I quite answered the question, but uh, that's, that's, that's the answer so far. Thanks, Dr. Graham. And this question might be for you. Um, where do you get grants to cover testing for undocumented foreign-born persons? Yeah, so, you know, one thing that we realized was if we used our grant money, and this is DPH, uh, CDC, other HRSA grants, uh, JRI has a lot of funding from a variety of sources. If we use that grant money um, to pay for you know, uh, blood work for everybody and vaccines for everybody and, um, you know, and all the services we were providing. And I think a lot of programs like this would just use grant money to pay for everything. Um, you, we would, we would not have, we would not be able to expand. We would not have a sustainable program because, you know, you're just dependent on the grants that you get. And, and if they run out, then you, you can't do anymore. And so that was why it was really important to be able to figure out how to tap into health insurance for those people who did have health insurance, because that then left more money to use for people who didn't have health insurance. Um, and that meant really working with specialty pharmacy and um, a, a laboratory services um, uh, 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 organization, because we don't have any billing ability. Um, in this program. So we don't bill for medical visits or anything. Thanks, Dr. Graham. Now we have a question for Dr. Wong. Um, we have a compliment saying that the dashboards and reminders are good information and workflows in the EHR can improve health outcomes. Um, this person has participated in other coalitions on improving hep C screening, treatment, HPV vaccinations, et cetera. And the question here is, is there an opportunity for United Action to get EMR vendors to improve their dashboards and include population management tools in their standard products. Not as expensive add-ons that many community health centers can afford. Um, and there's some other, including the outreach tools for recall for immunizations or testing. So, Dr. Wong, I if you need to repeat that, but. Um, so I, let me see if I understand the question correctly. The question is, is there opportunity to try to get electronic health record vendors to have uh, tools that help with hepatitis B um, screening, immunization, and management? Yes, that's the way I'm reading it, yes. Um, so the optimist in me says yes. Um, I think that in our community health center world, um, where we have health center control networks, and in many cases, um, they are using a common um, electronic health record platform um, that, you know, volumes um, of users, um, you know, they carry clout. Um, and I think that um, the opportunities do exist to be able to do that. I think that health centers that are using a common um, electronic health record, um, even if they are not part of a larger organization like an HCCN can also um, take advantage of the work that their colleagues at other health centers have done using the same platform. Thanks, Dr. Wong. And I just wanna remind folks that, yeah, we're coming up on the hours, so you can continue submitting questions and we can direct those offline. And if you're leaving us early that you'll have a survey eval um, prompting you to complete um, after you close the Zoom window. So we appreciate you all joining us today. And we do have one more question in the chat box. Um, and this one says, do you have seroprotection rates for twin RICs, um, 0721D 12 months versus hep lasav B? And not a clinician, so I'm not sure uh, which of you panelists can answer that. Oh, well, I mean, TwinRex is going to be similar to um, Indurex B because uh, the, the hepatitis B part of TwinRex is the same. It's just the hepatitis A has been, you know, divided up into three. Um, and so you're going to have a similar 
uh, seroprotection rates, which uh, are clearly inferior uh, to to hepatitis A B. Uh, there's just no question. Um, there's a group of people, and you know, all of you in the health profession know this. You know, somebody who's you know, been turned into a pin cushion, getting round after round of, you know, vaccination for hepatitis B, and they just don't respond. There's a group of people that don't respond to the older vaccines. Um, and it seems like uh, this vaccine can overcome that. So there's a lot of implications for that. I think for our, um, for occupational health, it's really important to make sure that in the healthcare profession, people are vaccinated. Um, uh, actually, at Beth Israel Deaconess, uh, we had an issue with sexual assault victims um, not having a detectable hepatitis B surface antibody. And then you are in a situation of, do you just give them a booster? Maybe they don't respond. Do you give them HBIG? Now we give them um, hepatitis B. So it's actually changed a number of our workflows. Thanks, Dr. Graham. So I just want to respect everyone's time and say that this has been a great set of speakers and panelists, and we hope you found the presentations helpful and insightful in your work as you increase FB screening vaccination and linkage to care in your own organizations. And these are some resources. And as Dr. Wong mentioned, the citation for the study on the HIP B project that ICHS is included here um, on the second um, right hand side. And just want to say keep in touch with us at App Show and our speakers and want to wish you all a great rest of your week. Thank you so much. <laughs>